Welcome to the Glassworking Shop. I'm continuing to evolve the design of my triangular hexagonal marine assembly based on the idea of Damascus borrowed from blacksmithing. There's a lot in common between blacksmithing and glasswork, and I think that it's really a kind of a cool thing to combine together different ideas from different processes and different, uh, different approaches. And anyway, this is the third version of the design that I'm making. The first was documented on video, the second was not. And I'm going to be documenting part of this one on video. I'm not going to get too repetitive. I'm not going to show every single repeated prep if they're all the same except for color, but I'm going to show every operation that I perform on the Inqualla and the squeezer to kind of show you what's possible with these tools. So a question that I've had ever since I started making these videos, should I edit them, should I speed them up, or should I show them in real time? And I'm sure there's arguments to be uh, made for both uh, approaches, but I remember when I was getting started, when I was used doing glasswork for the first time, and I looked at some of the videos online and was kind of confused because for a beginner, one of the most important things that you need to learn is timing and to try to get the timing right by watching a video that's sped up or edited is, it can be rather difficult. I remember uh, showing one of my teachers one of the videos that I was trying to learn from and telling him how much trouble I was having figuring out what the glass worker was doing and he said, dude, it's sped up and edited. Here, let me show you. And for that reason, I think I'm going to be doing my glassworking videos in real time. Glasswork is slow. A lot of it may seem really boring. You know, if you already know what's going on, you've got a fast forward button. That's the nice thing about YouTube. You can choose your playback speed. But I think for, for those who are not yet experienced in glasswork and are trying to learn something, well, Maybe seeing the timing might help. Also, another question that has come up, do I show my mistakes? And yeah, I do. Um, it's important, I mean, everybody makes mistakes. The best in the world make mistakes. And sometimes it's very informative to see, well, okay, how do you recover from that one? So hopefully I won't make any mistakes in today's video, but uh, hey, you know, it is what it is. The camera's rolling and I don't edit. Well, I mean, if I have to go take a whiz, I'm going to, you know, edit out the empty shop, but, or if I run out of oxygen or something like that. So anyway, first thing I'm going to do here is reconfigure the squeezer. Going to take out the large parallel dies and put in the hexagonal iris style dies. The iris style dies have strengths and weaknesses like every tool. Also notice the quick disconnect die change feature on the squeezer. Makes it much faster to change configuration the squeezer is still a prototype under development. I'm planning on making, on basically starting over again and making another one completely from scratch, not reusing any of these parts. As I continue to evolve and perfect the design, and who knows, maybe, maybe one day I'll even offer them for sale. I have no idea if there's a market for it. I have no idea what I might charge for it, but I'm still evolving it and perfecting it just because I'm an inventor and it's what I do. The iris dies have the advantage of being able to squeeze any size. Unlike a fixed size die, 
which you can see here, the fixed size dies can only squeeze the one size they're designed for. And that's why over on the die rack, which you probably can't see well in the video, I have, I don't know, 50, 60 dies for different size things, including some special shapes. The iris style can do any hexagonal size, but the downside of the iris is that the, the motion of the glass is going to have some sliding going on. And even though the graphite is really, really smooth, that sliding along the surface of the glass produces distortion. You can minimize the distortion by putting the hot glass in, touching the surface of the hot glass before applying squeezing pressure, and then you touch it, freeze it, and then squeeze it, and that minimizes the distortion, but it doesn't eliminate the distortion. For the work I'm doing today, I'm basically making a rod stack bullseye uh, assembly. Distortion doesn't matter, who cares? It's a solid color all the way around. I don't care, this is fast, it works. In other cases, you know, the distortion can be used artistically as the glass flows around the outside of the pattern, sometimes it actually looks cool. If I want more precision, where the force is precisely perpendicular to the piece of glass, then I have to use the fixed size dies, and I have to choose the correct one. So today, I'm going to be doing a rod stack bullseye subassembly. And probably before I get into that, I should talk about something else. That when I started doing glasswork, I just kind of went out to the bench and turned on the torch and picked up some rods and just, hey, I don't know, I think I'll fumble around with this. And sometimes I got surprised in a good way. Some, most often I got surprised in a bad way. Most of the things didn't come out. And then when they did come out, sometimes I'd look back at a piece and I'd go, wow, I forgot how I did that. That's really cool. I wish I remembered how I did that. And I also you know, remember being told by one of my teachers, always have a plan when you go out into the glassworking shop. Don't just go out and start dicking with stuff. Always have a plan. So this project, I actually do have a plan. I made a schematic diagram and I'm now showing that on the video. The schematic diagram is what it says. It's a schematic diagram. It shows me what components I need to make and roughly how they go together, but once they go together and get squeezed into the final shape, they're gonna look nothing like the diagram, but the diagram helps me remember what it is that I'm making. So. In today's video, I'm going to be making a rod stack bullseye marine. And I do this, I know there's more than one way to accomplish the thing that I'm trying to accomplish. And for me, this particular approach seems to make sense. Let me get over here to the the camera here. I don't know if you can see it very well. I don't really have very good lighting. I got seven color rods, a black rod in the center and oil lava orange rods around the outside. And I'm going to take some stainless safety wire, which is commonly used in aviation and motor sports to keep uh, screws and bolts from unscrewing. It's actually, I think the Navy did a, a test where they determined that safety wire was the most secure way to prevent fasteners from loosening in a high vibration aviation environment. So I now have, I don't know if you can see it in the video, the lighting is rather poor, I've got a stack of seven rods, the black in the core, and then the 
orange around the outside, safety wired together. So I'm going to put them in my little holding fixture here and going to heat them and fuse them together and then stripe the outside with black. So I've prepared a, a punty here and it's just a piece of 15 millimeter rod with a kind of a bulbous end and get the torch going. I know there's more than one way to create this kind of a bullseye. Um, I think, like I did with my, uh, with the pieces I made in the last video, um, my uh, striped rectangles, uh, yes, I could make the core by wadding up a rod and then striping it. Uh, trying to stripe a single color rod, stripe a thick stripe on a single color rod is rather difficult. The color rod kind of isn't that stable and, you know, maybe I just don't have the skill. I don't know. But I find this method gives me a nicely proportioned little bullseye, which is mostly orange with just a little black dot in the center which is kind of like what I'm looking for artistically. So heating the, the punty and the inkwala, and then heating the end of the color rods with the hand torch. I'm just using cold color rods. Um, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Notice that I'm able to lift the clamp and secure the clamp with one hand because of the way the clamp design is done. So now, heating the end of the rods, I kind of got off topic there. Some of my more complex assemblies where I've got more time invested, I'll preheat everything in the kiln. But for this operation, hey, no problem. Just heat the end of a cold rod, get that old punty in place. Boom, stick it on. Kind of wiggle it around a little to make sure everything is going to be sticking nice. So now the rod stack is like super unstable at the moment. And what I need to do immediately is to stabilize it. So I'm heating the end somewhat gently. I'm going to switch to a slightly more oxidizing, so neutral with a slightly oxidizing flame in the far end of the flame. This cadmium color is pretty sensitive to boiling. So Got to kind of be careful here. Now I'm going to very carefully, since heat was used on this fixture, I put my hand above the fixture just to go, hmm, am I going to hurt myself touching this? Nope, it's safe. Even though I know it's safe, there was no question there that it was safe. It's good to get into that habit of every time you touch something that might be hot, assume it's hot. And just kind of like get close, feel the radiant heat. So it's important to get this first step done quickly because if I dawdle, then the, the punty end is going to get cold and crack. So I kind of have to get this Get this done as quick as I can. So now I'm switching to the Delta Mag flame. 
And like I said in the previous video, I'm not using the Delta Mag flame because I want a super blistering hot flame. I'm using it because I want a large volume of relatively cold flame. So I'm out in the back of the flame. I've got a slightly oxidizing little bit, you know, pretty much neutral to slightly oxidizing flame so I don't boil the color. And I'm just trying to build some core heat, establish a heat base, and keep that kind of the moil on the end of the punty from cracking, make sure that make sure that weld is still stable. When I first started doing that, when I first started doing this process of doing the rod stacking, that was one of my first beginner mistakes, was to let the the moil and the weld get cold, and then I was surprised that why are my rods falling off? So, just very gently here, I probably should turn on the ventilation. I turned my ventilation off so that I could uh, talk without sound in the background. I'm using a large diameter, it's a 24 inch diameter fan rotating slowly. And that's kind of like the the way fans work, a small diameter fan rotating quickly is going to be noisy. A large diameter fan rotating slowly is going to be quiet. So I bought a 24 inch fan with an AC motor and discovered that when I tried speed controlling it, that AC, uh, well not, not all AC motors, but if I had a, a VFD and a three-phase motor, it wouldn't be a problem, but the single phase, the kind of the split phase AC motors, when you try putting a speed control on it, well, it barely works at all. So I took out the AC motor, put on a DC motor with a power supply, with a variable DC power supply, and now I can get it to run really slow. So get back to the glass work here over to the squeezer, going to make the first squeeze just to kind of like stick everything together because as I'm heating the rod stack, if I get too aggressive heating the rod stack before it's tagged, the rods are going to start bulging out. And yeah, ask me how I know that. So little bit by little bit. Now that it's tagged, it's relatively stable, and I can concentrate on building the heat base, and more importantly, forcing out the air. Because I certainly don't want bubbles in my piece. I'm going to make sure that my punty is the same size. The stack that I'm making here is three and a half inches long. The squeezer dies are four inch. And I've kind of determined by trial and error that, you know, pretty much anything over three or four inches is going to be so unstable, either doing it by hand or on the Inquala. It just, an unsupported end, very difficult to control. So what I'm doing now, as I'm continuing to consolidate this thing, I'm pressing a little bit down as I'm squeezing. to shorten and thicken, as well as driving out the air. I'm not concentrating the heat on the end, the far end, so if there's any air in the piece, it should have at least 
a fighting chance of escaping through the through the end. I could use the Inqualo for this, but as the as the piece gets looser and floppier, I find that I just have more control by hand, which of course kind of show kind of demonstrates the point. The Inqualo is a handwork assistant designed to be used in conjunction with handwork. And yeah, it is possible to do an entire project on the Inqualla, but it's also possible to switch back and forth. And to, as you're working on some, you know, sometimes do it by hand, sometimes do it on the Inqualla, sometimes switch back and forth as you try to perfect the technique and figure out <coughs> figure out what's the best. So now I've shortened this guy a little bit and it's now fully compacted, shorter, nice and smooth hexagon. So now I'm going to round it up by hand, kind of the old school traditional way on the, on the graphite. I'm doing pretty good on not having, not boiling my color. I'm going to be upgrading the shop to, I just ordered a Herbie and I'm going to be installing compressed air. So I'm going to see if possible, and I may may actually put a, a, uh, a fitting in a valving system to see about adding compressed air to the to the delta mag but of course when I mentioned it to one of my teachers he said dude learn to use your torch you don't need compressed air the delta mag can do it all And then one of my other teachers said, oh man, I love my Herbie. They're great. Delta Mag's good for some things, but I use my Herbie more. So, like everything else, there's more than one tool to solve a problem and more than one way to approach things. And room for lots of different attitudes and opinions. So that is getting to be a pretty nice uniform cylindrical substrate. And then in the next operation, going to be striping it. And as I said in the previous video, I really do like using the Inqualo for striping. I understand that the traditional method talking here, I seem to have developed a little bit of droopage. The traditional method of striping, where you use a rod and a bench torch, works well for some people. 
They achieve excellent results doing it this way. But me? Yeah, I like scraping on the Inquala. Feels more like welding. And since I'm a welder, feels real natural. So, I'm going to kind of let the substrate cool down for just a, a few seconds. Don't want to get it too cold. It's got to be warm enough that the color rod sticks. But if I stripe with the substrate too hot and don't have my striping rod sufficiently soft and I push too hard, I can put divots in the substrate. So I like to let it cool down just a little bit. Then, using the Mirage Hand Torch with, looks like about a neutral flame, I'm going to be preheating the rod. Putting almost all of the flame on the rod, only the spill from the edges is actually getting on the substrate going a little bit beyond going a little bit beyond the color so you get the, mo the most useful yield. I'm using the positioning mode on the Inquala where it's normally stopped and every press of the foot pedal, every time you press the foot pedal, it starts moving. Release the foot pedal, it stops moving. And this is the perfect operating mode for striping on the Inquala. I still haven't mastered tearing off the hot rod at the end. I always end up with this Kind of giant ass booger on the end. Who knows, maybe someday I'll learn. I'm pointing the torch as I'm switching to the rod holder, carefully looking at where the torch is pointing so I don't set anything on fire. Get that rod back up to temperature. I'm also making sure that at least some flame gets on the previous stripe so that I fill up that little acute angle. When the stripe is applied on the side, there's a little acute angle, and glass doesn't like acute angles. So there's nothing cute about acute angles. So I gotta make sure that as I'm striping, I'm forcing the rod into the acute angle which, of course, prevents the formation of air bubbles. And I have yet to make a 100% bubble-free piece, but I'm working on it. So anyway, striping with the hand torch on the Inquala, I find it to be much more intuitive it fits my style a whole lot better, and I believe I get excellent results doing it. Of course, others, probably the majority of glass workers, do it the traditional way, get excellent results, and many of them may look at the way I'm doing it and saying, dude, that's completely backward, what's wrong with you? Well, like I said before, there are many, many different approaches. What works for you, works for you. But I'm making, part of the reason I'm making this video is to show that there are other options. There are other ways to accomplish the goal using this tool. And to all Inquala users, I would suggest, hey, why not try it? At least try it once. If you don't like it, go back to go back to the old way.
Now, you probably can't see what I just did on the video. It's kind of hard to see, but I ended up getting my last stripe. As I was going along, I got a little bit out of parallel, so the last stripe I needed to put down was smaller at the top and wider at the bottom. And all I did was just kind of slow down. As I got to the bottom, I slowed down, made a thicker stripe. So now that I'm back in rotation mode, and of course the Inqualla remembers the rotation speed and direction, so when it goes into rotation mode, it goes back into rotation mode at the same speed and direction that it was set last time. First thing I'm going to do is knock off the little nubbins. I'll lock off the twist axis. I don't need twist for this operation. I'm going to knock off these little nubbins a little bit more. Um, if the glass is going to crack, it's going to crack right at those little nubbins on the end. And, of course, yes, I learned that the hard way many times, and so now I'm trying to be very, very careful about avoiding. There's a lot of little acute angles there, and if it's going to crack, it's going to crack at the acute angle. So, far flame, delta mag flame, neutral to slightly oxidizing, fairly small, coldish flame. The North Star Jet Black is nowhere near as sensitive as the the cadmium colors but still kind of being careful now you you may notice for those who are knowledgeable about the inqualla you may notice that I'm not using lock colors for the duration of work that I'm doing. It's short enough that I don't really need lock colors. Drift isn't a problem. Now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to reverse direction to control twist. Doesn't really matter because I'm making a bullseye, but as I said before in the other video, it's good to practice. Just even when it doesn't matter. Just see, well, okay, if I wanted to control twist, how well could I control it? Because I'm sure that someday I'll be doing a project where twist matters. As I get closer to the unstable end on a single-sided lathe, there's always the chance I'm going to get some drooping. More than a chance, it's actually a certainty it will droop. Which, of course, gives me a, a chance to show how to control droop. There I have a droop. Up to the top, stop, fall. Using the start-stop button controls the droop. Early in the development, and I think I said this in the, uh, in the last video, early in the development, it was suggested to put in pause and reverse. And it seems, that even though it seemed like a good idea at the time, pause and reverse actually doesn't work that well to control droop. So now, I'm going to just kind of finish it up by hand. It's almost perfect. It's almost completely melted in, almost completely uniform. Just about ready to pull. But I'm going to do that last little touch up the old school way. Okay, so I'm going to kind of park the piece, 
in the far flame, keep it warm out there. I could use a Bunsen to keep it warm, but for right now I'm just going to kind of go out in the far flame, grab my pre-made puller, made this before I started. So I'm going to get the end of the, the piece hot. Get my puller even hotter. The piece I'm attaching to, and I really don't like the way that end looks. I'm gonna get that end a little better. The end I'm sticking to needs to be hot enough to stick, but I don't want that end to be like super, super sloppy, because then when I stick in my puller punty, I'll end up distorting it and maybe lose a little of my yield of useful material. So, getting my puller nice and hot. So, yes, you can use a torch top marver with the Inquala. So now, I'm going to start building a heat base. And as I said in the previous video, that's just a technical term used in glass working. What I'm doing is trying to get the core uniformly hot. And Glass is an insulator, and so even though the outside looks really hot, the inside is cold, and I can tell that because the piece is still stiff. Not loose and sloppy yet. So if I'm going to pull this guy, and I'm going to pull it down to right about a color rod diameter, I'm going to pull it down to about a 7 millimeter diameter. As I continue to get the thing hot, I switch to handwork because it's important to be able to feel how the glass is working, how the glass is moving when it's about to get ready. And when doing a pull, it's very common to overheat the center and underheat the ends. And then when you pull, you get a really, really skinny piece in the middle and really, really fat cone-shaped ends called knuckles. And I want to get the maximum yield I can get. So I'm kind of concentrating the heat on the ends. And if I do that, the center will kind of take care of itself, almost takes care of itself because there's spill, there's transferred heat, there's a variety of different things, but what I'm trying to do, it's starting to feel loose and floppy. It's getting almost ready to pull, concentrating the heat on the ends. Don't want to let it get too far out of control. Take it out of the flame, let it stabilize for a moment before pulling and hopefully with any luck kind of blow on it when it's getting too thin with any luck I will get a nice uniform pull it is what I like. So that appears to be, let's see if you can 
see it on the video here. Not perfectly uniform, but will be sufficient for the next step that I'm going to do. So, I'll just nip that guy off. Probably safe because it's so thin. I think it's safe to bench cool this guy. So, in the next step, after these guys cool a little bit, in the next step, I'm going to do the whole thing over again using these rods. So, I'm going to make a seven rod stack of my little black and orange bullseyes. And then that will form, and these will be pulled to about a half an inch in diameter and then pressed into the sides of the triangles, and that will form the decoration on the side. The center of the triangles is made of the Damascus style uh, seven layers of rectangles assembled together as a square and then squeezed in. Then I squeeze in the side, bump in the sides, and put in these rods into the sides.